little bit about our treatment philosophy at Professional. We talked about it in Essentials, but this is the pyramid. We know the pyramid started, we talked about Al Neal, started the hierarchy of athletic development. Al started it um, many years ago in the strength and conditioning world. Al is a, is a world known strength and conditioning coach. Also with Rob Penarello, who's our chief clinical officer, took it more towards the rehab side of it. And then a little bit more in evaluation and the added the mobility part, as well as a work, um, motor, motor control component of the pyramid. And we've taken it even further, added the evaluation, added the component of the inflammatory process, pain management, mobility, and then we went up the chain. The key to this is in order to get to each part of the pyramid next level, you have to have the capacity to um, achieve the qualifications of each level. And we'll talk about that later. So as we go through it, so now as it looks, as we have the, the evaluation part, in the evaluation part on the right side, we talk about its classification. We talk, talk about called a positional deficit, mobility deficit, motor control deficit, or a power deficit. And that's the important part. The next part we go is the, our inflammatory or pain management. As we go up the pyramid, if you find that your patient is pain dominant, a lot of inflammation, um, high level irritation, we go to this area where we try to calm down patient symptoms. We don't really want to move forward that quickly because they're early irritated. It's hard for the body to gain either range of motion, strength, et cetera. So this is the component. But once we get that in, under control, then we can go into the mobility part. We talk about that as the attain part of our pyramid, which is, which is attain the position. We can do that through what we'll call about directional preference, a la McKenzie. We can do also something called centration, which I like is a word where it puts the joint in its mid position. Or we could do typical, we call mobility deficits. And we'll talk through that. After you get those and you start working up your, your motor control work capacity and strength, this is your maintain part. You activate the muscle and then you start to strengthen it. An example going up the pyramid so far would be you buy by your knee patient, the highly inflamed, irritable knee is swollen. Before you move on, you really want to be able to take care of the inflammatory pain management side. You might do heat, ice, rest, compression, elevation, any of those components of it to calm it down. Next phase, we go into the mobility part. Let's say they don't have full knee extension. We want to attain full knee extension. Once we get that, and with that, we start to do attain, maintain. So we start to do isometrics, work our way up. Then we start to do some basic strengthening. Then we get into the next part, which is called power, power elastic strength or speed. This is the move part. Okay, the assimilation of movement. It's the strength, power elastic strength, move on the patient onto more functional movement patterns. So every patient can go through that regardless or irregardless of their classification. We have to, we have to go through that pyramid in order to attain, attain full function. So let's talk a little bit about this part, the evaluation part. What's the classifications we use? The first one is called positional deficit. And we'll talk about that mobility, again, motor control and power deficit. We go into directional preference, which is in the positional deficit, is directional preference is the clinical phenomena where any movement in any direction or sustained position, research in a clinically relevant improvement in symptoms. So less pain, improved range of motion, increased function. And that's a general term. We could use directional preference for your spine patients, where we call it centralization. We can also call it for your extremity patients, which we call it localization. So if you look at this, you have centralization, you have directional preference is the big category. Okay. And then within that, the spine part is centralization. That means that through movement or position, as you repeat that position or movement, that pain will become more centralized, gone from the more distal to proximal. Where in the spine is centralization, we talk about extremities, we talk about localization. We don't necessarily cause something that's going to, doesn't centralize in the extremities. But an example on the extremities for directional preference might be, if I can't move my arm above my head into flexion, if I can do an act, a movement or an act or mobilization, it helps centrate that joint in the middle. So I might do repeated extension, stretch out those anterior structures, have that humeral head in a better position, or do my anterior to posterior glides, and all of a sudden I come back and they have better range. Those are called quick responders, and those are that's a directional preference for tremors. As we move on, when we go into, let's say we 
there is no directional preference. Then we look, hmm, is there a limited range of motion? Can the patient perform full active range of motion with a stable position or with active stabilization? So basically, if I can't turn my head to left or right, but the stable position might be supine, or gravity limited, and I have full range of motion, or active stabilization is when a patient tries to activate the core muscles, so the retraction here, activate the core through the flex, and all of a sudden they have good range of motion. That's active stabilization. So we're asking can the patient perform full range of motion with stable position or active stabilization? If it's no, then we're dealing with a more of a mobility deficit. And we have to do further testing to see is it truly a joint problem or a myofascial soft tissue problem? Again, there's no muscle that we it can affect the joint glide. So if we get in there with our hands and we do an A to P glide and a posterior glide is normal, but we're still restricted, then we think that's more of a joint issue. If we're in that position, and then we're able to go through that, we go through that position, we do that glide, and all of a sudden they have, um, they have that glide, then we think maybe more myofascial or soft tissue restriction. The other side, let's say the patient can perform it with active range of motion with a stable position, they can do it. So now all of a sudden we, put, we turn their head here, but we're playing down and have full range of motion. And we think that's more of a stability mode of control issue. The patient's trying to stabilize because gravity is pushing down and they can't move their neck. But as soon as you take away those needs, they have full range of motion. And we, our priority is more, this is more of a stability mode of control issue. And lastly, if we look at some of an overuse injury, tissue has surpassed its adaptive potential okay, and pain with resistive testing. These are your tendinopathies. If that is true, then we go into a power deficit. And the key is shift treatment flow, this part of the pyramid, if they have a, an inflammatory pain, we should go right towards that. If they have a positional deficit, they're a quick responder, treat that. Treat mobility. And before you treat stability mode control, the key is always look up the pyramid. So even if a patient is, let's say we put them in a motor control uh, category, we still have to look other mobility deficits on there before we look at motor control. So let's say, for example, I have a motor control issue in my neck. My standing, I can only go 50 degrees, lay me down, I get 80. We know there's a motor, definitely a motor control problem, but I have to also look based on the pyramid. Let me find that there's mobility issues above and below, upper cervical, thoracic, those type of things. Clear those first and you still go up the pyramid. So it's good to have a classification, but no matter what, how you classify the patient, you're still gonna go from the bottom up, which is a key part of the pyramid. So now we're looking at inflammatory pain control. Again, if we have that, we stop. We take care of that anti-inflammatories if we need to, positioning control. We go up the pyramid, now we have a mobility deficit. And let's say we have directional specific mobility exercises. We can do those if it's centralization, do the exercises that help the person centralize. If it's more of a localization problem with an extremity, again, repeat the motion and it helps them um, localize those symptoms. Or if it's a true mobility problem, like a capsulitis, do exercises that put strain through that tissue in order to gain that mobility. As you work our up, the next part will be a motor control. So we got the mobility, mobility trumps stability. We got motor control part. These are graded exercises. The purpose of it is to begin people to function, promote function. You're not gaining strength, you're getting, we teach them how to move correctly. And that's a lot of the parts. So the example might be for somebody with that knee problem. They're really slow and we took the inflammation down. Now they have to be quad sets or isometric contractions to find that re teach that pattern. If you've seen a patient post, you know, anterior cruciate ligament repair, um, you'll see that, or um, you'll see that they wind up having um, inflammation and comment down that they can't get their quads to kick in. You have to get that motor control part. And a lot of times just a couple, either e stim or something like that will get them to activate. So you know it's more of a motor control than to a strength issue. Same thing with lumbar spine. I think we do a lot of lumbar spine, we go to right away bird dogs and bigger muscles, don't forget transverse abdominis or internal obliques or you know, 
breathing diaphragm, pelvic floor, and multi back, a little bit deeper stuff, the motor control muscles. Once we got that, then we start going to strength, which we talked about is, is important. Yeah, it's the ability to exert force, and it's the most basic physical quality that we have. The relationship with power and speed is that if you don't have strength and you can't go to power, you can't go to speed because you need those as, as your base. That quality of strength is important in order to go up that pyramid. If somebody, for example, doesn't have good uh, gastroc strength and they go to jump and try to jump up, th that strength, they will actually, as soon as they land on the ground, they won't have the strength and they'll kind of collapse like a folding chair. So we need to have that basic foundation is the basic foundation of athletic performance strength. And as we move up the pyramid, we talk about next is we talk about power. The interesting part about power, remember, we, we know power is force times distance over time. So it has a time component to it. For an athlete, it's the ability to go from A to B, any, any athlete, even if it's your total knee, post-total knee replacement, older person, quote unquote, life athlete, they have to go to sit to stand. It's a power force over time. Strength is important, but you need now to get there in a certain amount of time. And the, the example of it, it's rate of force development. In sports requiring acceleration, it is considered to one of the most important variables affecting performance in sports. Okay. And then when you well, if that, if you look at this video, you'll see this gentleman, this young man coming from the pool, it's probably four or five feet pool, be able to jump and it's not backwards, be able to jump out of the water. This is power. That's a pretty powerful force times difference over time. And then as we go out, next we go into elastic strength. Elastic strength starts to get into what we would call plyometrics. Um, it uses the stretch shortening cycle. And again, the ability of the body to be elastic. You know, we talk about the springiness, so the stiffness is required. And it's the purest form of bonding. But again, it needs those other criteria for it to get that part of it. Some of the errors might be that we try to do plyometrics early. People don't have good range of motion, they don't have good strength, they don't have any power, so you can't get to elastic strength. And lastly is speed. Speed is a component we probably won't get to in rehab, but perform activities in the lower part of the pyramid to progress up the pyramid. And there are people that do their whole career just based on training speed. Hierarchy of rehabilitation and it's like development. As we go through it, always go through the pyramid. Don't forget, start from the bottom, if there's pain, Treat that first, work mobility, motor control, strength, power. No matter who the patient is, in reality, no matter what the classification is, still go through that pyramid. We'll talk about that for the rest of the mentorship. And you'll see within the mentorship, each body part will go a bit more specific. What is the mobility for the knee, for the shoulder, et cetera? Work our way through.